7. be pretty simple if we just went to church. We hear the word here, let it go out here, and we don't do anything about it. But that's not what the Bible calls us to do. Tonight the title is Be Ye Hearers and Doers. And sometimes the doer part is a lot harder than the hearer part. Starting in verse 19, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to speak. Wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. I'm going to stop there a little bit. I think if we are honest with ourselves and we look back into our past, I don't think any of us can be very proud of the tracks we've left behind us. I can't. I think that's partly what he's saying. We forget what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, he deceiveth his own heart, and this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their afflictions and to keep himself unspotted from the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask you to bless this word tonight. Help us to have our ears open, our hearts softened, and let us from that point Go out and be doers of your word. We ask you to sing the name of Jesus. Amen. Verse 19. When we talk too much and we listen too little, we actually communicate to others that we think our ideas are more important than theirs. Here James wisely advises us to reverse this process Let's put a mental stopwatch on our conversations and keep track of how much we talk and how much we listen. James is also warning against anger that erupts when our egos are bruised. I am hurt. My opinions are not heard. Outrage has become the normal reaction to anyone who disagrees with us when injustice and sin occur but we should become angry 
when we see her because of others are being hurt in a righteous way. But we should not become angry when we fail to win an argument or when we feel offended or neglected. So here in James 1, we are seeing three marks of immature believers. That person is joyful in trials. You see that in verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now the second mark of maturity is in verse 13. It says, let no man, when he is tempted, say, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So we are to be joyful in trials and triumphant in temptations. Now the third mark of maturity we find in verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, which is able to save your souls. We can't be a mature believer without the right relationship with the Bible, which is God's word. I believe that our relationship to God is the most important relationship that we can have. We can't be properly related to God or to others without being a man or a woman of the Bible. That may be extreme, but I believe it's to be true. If we aren't rightly related to the Bible, we will not be rightly related to the God of the Bible. The Bible is God's love letter to us. If we want to know God, if we want to serve God, and if we want to have fellowship with God, and if you want to reflect God in your life, in your marriage, and in your family, we must be a man or a woman of the Bible. We must know what the Bible says. We can't neglect the Bible and be a mature Christian. As we break down this text, you'll agree with this. In this text, we see three things. Number one, in verse 19, we must hear the word. Remember what I said. We can go to church, we can let it go in here, and we can go out of here. And what use does it come to church? Nothing. We must receive the word. We must obey the word. All three of these points are called imperatives or commands. These are not optional. If you're not too busy, try these three things. Hearing, receiving, and obeying the word of God. These are commands. And from God's commands come God's enabling you to obey them. Looking at verse 19, it starts with wherefore. The rule is wherefore there is a wherefore or therefore, find out what it is, therefore. So if we go back to verse 18, James says, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, or the Bible. The word of God, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, here James ends the previous section by saying that God in his own sovereign will regenerated us or we were born again and one of the instruments involved in our rebirth was the word of truth which is a reference to the scriptures, the Bible. Having mentioned the Bible in verses 18, James goes on to talk about it in verse 19 to 27 that we should be doers of the word and not hearers only. The context takes us back one verse to the word of truth, which is also called the implanted word. Verse 21, and the perfect law of liberty. In verses 25, so the word of God in relation to the child of God is very important. In verse 19, James is speaking to Christians when he says, my beloved brethren, so what we're reading in this text are actually commands for the household of faith, the believers, the children of God. And James gives us three commands. Number one, be swift to hear. It means a readiness or eagerness to listen to God's word. 
I'm reminded of the story of Samuel. Hannah prayed to God saying, O Lord, if you will give me your maid, your servant, a male child, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. So after Samuel was about five years old, Hannah took Samuel to the temple and left him with Eli the priest to be raised in the temple. Samuel later would become one of the great prophets in the nation of Israel. But Eli had sons who were very wicked. It was a bad environment to be raised in. One night Samuel went to bed and before he fell asleep, the Lord called him. And Samuel thought Eli was calling him, so he jumps up out of bed and goes to Eli and says, Here I am. Eli said, I didn't call you. Go lay down again. Samuel went back to bed, but again the Lord called. Samuel, again Samuel thought Eli was calling him. So he goes to Eli and says, Here I am. On the third time God called, Samuel again went to Eli and said, Here I am. Now Eli realized that the Lord had called Samuel. So this time, Eli told Samuel that when God called again, Samuel would just say, Speak, for your servant hears. So when God called this time, Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Now I would suggest to all of us that that should be our prayer. When we read the Bible, we should say, speak, for your servant hears. When we are at church and the word is being read as it is, say, speak, for your servant hears. Here in verse 19, it says that we should be slow to speak. Now, the Greek philosopher, Zeno, said, we have two ears, one mouth. Therefore, we should be listening twice as much as we speak. Brothers and sisters, I must say, I can learn much more, just as much sitting in that pew as I can standing up here talking to you. Although, when you go in deep study of God's word, you do learn, and you learn a lot. When we do all the talking, we're not learning. And when we're listening, we're learning. And Proverbs 10, 19 says this, In the multitude of words that wanteth not sin, but he that reframeth his lips is wise. So now let us be swift to hear, slow to speak. And now the third point, slow to wrath. Wrath is a harboring of angry, resentful feelings. An angry spirit is not a teachable spirit. Verse 20 is the rationale for this. In verse 19, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When we are angry, we will not receive from God through his word. When we're mad at the world, we're mad at God. You're mad at others and there's anger in your hearts. Then our hearts are not going to be open. It won't be soft. It will not be receptive. Some people do come to church and sometimes you kind of feel you can feel vibes, I should maybe not say vibes, but you can feel sometimes when people come in, they're hurt, emotionally upset. And they just, well, they just, they, they just really don't want to be here. But in the end, they're glad they came. If their heart becomes receptive. I can't see their heart, but I can feel the feelings coming off of people. I can sense their hurt. So my prayer is that God would soften their hearts. God would open their minds. 
God would let their ears hear and that it would penetrate to the soul. And most importantly, that God would give me the words to spring comfort and conviction. And comfort for everybody. So let's remember, the wrath of man doesn't produce righteousness of God. It might be keeping us from hearing the word of God. The word demands our attention and our reception. Verse 21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. The word receive speaks of a welcoming or appropriating reception. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. I'm listening. Can that be our prayer tonight? Speak, Lord. I'm listening. Speak, Lord, I'm hearing. Speak, Lord, I want to do your will. It means to embrace it, the word. We need to embrace the word. We need to make this word our own. We need to get it deep down into our hearts. This was used of the Bereans in Acts 17, verse 11, where it says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. When Paul preached the word at Berea, they did not reject the word. They searched the word. They listened to the word. They checked out what they heard with the scriptures. And when the Bible is read, Realize it is the word of God. And make your heart receptive to God's word. This means embrace it. Bring it into yourself. Embrace it. Put it in your heart. Put it in your mind. Put it in your spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says this, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth. The word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. This is awesome. To have a congregation hearing the word and then receiving the word and not as the word of man, but as the word of God. Verse 21 talks about engrafted word. God wants to graft his word into your heart so your life might bear fruit like seed does. To the glory of God, Jesus gave an interesting parable, which is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. In Matthew 13, in this story, Jesus gave four kinds of soil. It's about how the soil received the seed from the farmer and the fruit that was born or not born by it. The soils are a picture of the human heart. The seed is a picture of the word of God. He who preaches the word and are receptive to it. Now back in Bible times, the farmer, my understanding back in that time, the farmer and those people, the man, they would wear a long robe down to here and when it came to planting time, they would pick up part of this robe in a basket towel and lay the seed in here. And as they walked back and forth in the road, they would go like this here with their hands broadcasting that seed. That's the same way my dad used to do when he planted alfalfa seed. He planted by hand, back and forth, back and forth, over 10, 5 to 10 acre, 20 acre fields sometimes. That's the way they did it in old times. In this story here, Jesus gave four kinds of soil, and that's about the kind of seed soil received from seeds from the farmer. The fruit that was born or not born by it. The soils are a picture of the human heart. The seed is a picture of the word of God. He who preaches the word is not receptive. Now, back in Bible times, I already brought that up here, about the garment being pulled up and basket out of it, walk down the field and throw the seed as you walk. 
It was very simple but effective. Jesus said the first soil was hard. That would be like me going, plant, trying to plant a seed in here. I'd be going up and down these roads in the church and just spreading the seed all over there. Are we going to get any harvest from that off the carpet? No. Or you go out there on the hard-packed soil where somebody drives a lot of the cars on or walks on a lot and has a path. The seed falls in there. Not very much chance it'll grow. The soil was hard, so the seed just lay on the surface. And the birds would come along and eat it. The seed did not penetrate. So it wouldn't bring forth fruit. This represents the hard heart. Your heart has been hardened. So Satan is stealing God's seed and it's not penetrating your life. We can come to church week after week. And we can hear the gospel being taught week after week, day after day. And we can read the Bible for ourselves. But if the heart is hard, if the heart is hard, Satan is going to steal that seed so that it does not bear fruit. The second soil is shallow or emotional. It's a very thin layer of dirt over a rock which lacks depth. When the seed lands there, it starts to take root because it does have some soil. But because the dirt is shallow, when the plant springs up, it withers and it dies. It can't get moisture. This is the person who hears the word and starts to respond to the word, but there is no real commitment in their life. So they wither away spiritually and don't bring forth fruit. Now the third soil I call the crowded heart. It has weeds. Anybody like pulling weeds? Thinking back in my youth, that was one of my jobs. I'm talking knee high to a tadpole on up till I was 16. That was something mom and dad always said when we had any spare time rather than play. The garden needs weeds pulled. The seed that lands here begins to take root and grow, but the weeds choke out the plant so it can't bear fruit. When we pull out the weed from our gardens or from the flower rows, in a while, the weeds grow back. Let's think about all the weeds we pulled in our lifetime, and they just keep coming back. This soil represents a crowded heart where the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and lust for other things choke out God's word in our hearts. So we can't bear fruit. I'm going to stop there a little bit. I'm just going to give you an example. There was a time in my life when I made very good money as a dispatcher. But did money buy happiness? Does money ever buy happiness? A lot of times, the easier it comes, the easier it goes. And the more that comes in, the more you want. It's like an appetite that's never fulfilled. What am I getting at? I just spoke about the cares of the world. The more things we get, the more vehicles we have, the more material possessions we have, the more upkeep we have, the more expenses it becomes, the more unhappy we are. So I find it. Or I should say, so I found it. Why is that? Because the more things we have, the more care it takes to maintain what you have. And the more care you got to take to maintain what you have, the more it takes away from your time with the Lord and the Word.
Is it wrong to have a lot of things? No. But we have to have moderation. We have to be careful that we don't get so swamped up in things that we forgot, forget who our creator is. That we don't forget to thank him every day for our time here and for his eternal word to guide us to heaven. When we neglect this, we might as well not have the rest. Because the only place it's going to get to us if we neglect the word. And if we neglect God, we're going to end up in a lake of fire. And I don't think anybody here desires that. Verse 20, it talks about graft the word. How many of you have read that there? This is the person who hears the good word and starts to respond to word. There is no real commitment in their life. I read that. The deceitful and rich and lust for other things choke out God's word in our hearts. So we can't bear fruit. We have so many things in life to deal with that it can choke out God's word. I found that to be true in my own world, and that's why I have downsides. I don't need all that stuff to be happy, all the material goods. But sometimes we just have to learn to be content such as the Lord blesses us with. Now the fourth kind of soil or heart is the fruitful soil or a fruitful heart. Unlike the hard heart, you notice what I said, unlike the hard heart, it is soft. In farming, I remember going out there, the first thing you do, you stick the plow in the ground, you go back and forth, you plow up the ground into furrows, and then Dad would always have us go over with the color packer and trying to smash all these lumps down and break them down to where they're more workable. And then we'd drag it. We'd go along with the drag and we'd drag it all real nice and smooth and even try to knock more clumps out of there so it's ready for the seed. The heart, it is uh, Unlike the hard heart, it is soft. Unlike the shallow heart, it's deep. And unlike the crowded heart, the seed lands on this soil that is soft, deep, and clean, and it brings forth fruit. This is the fruitful heart. This soil produces 30, 60, or 100 fold. Here in verse 21, it's conditioned for receiving the word. We have to lay apart or aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness. So number one, if we're angry, God's word will be hindered. Number two, God's word will be hindered if we have sin in our life. So let's pull out these weeds, the sin. We can't grow unless we're willing to give up the sin the Bible condemns. If we have a sin in our life and we're not willing to repent, we won't grow further. We'll start sliding backward instead of going forward. We'll have hit a wall. As far as fresh understanding, <coughs> excuse me, fresh transformation and new revelation goes. If we don't obey what God reveals, he won't take us any deeper. It's not the scriptures that we don't understand that bothers me as it's the ones we do understand and we don't obey. Those are the ones that we that really should convict us. We need to convict, commit our life to God and be obedient to him. Let's now notice the manner in which we receive the word. Verse 21, with meekness. The word meekness doesn't convey weakness. There's a difference. Meekness conveys power under control. A meek horse isn't a weak horse. 
It's a horse that responds to every movement of the rider. It's an obedient horse. Jesus was, if you remember, meek and lowly in heart. He was obedient to the Father's will and command. So if we want to grow and mature, we need to have meekness toward God and toward others. Responding to the truth of God's word. So number one, we need to hear the word. Number two, we need to receive the word that is able to save our soul. And number three, obey the word. Verse 22 to 27 says, but be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, it is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes, and let's all ask ourselves, and if somebody wants to come to the altar, the altar's open. What is the condition of our heart today? Is our heart soft? Deep, clean, fruitful soil. When God's word comes into our heart, does it bring root and bring forth fruit to the glory of God? Or maybe there's filthiness or wickedness that have to be dealt with. Or maybe we've never accepted or believed Jesus and that he died for all our sins. He paid the price. Jesus already paid the price. All we have to do is come and ask for forgiveness. We have to repent. Would you come lay down whatever burdens you may have? Jesus is pleading for all of us to repent. Come and follow him. The altar is open.